Hi everyone, and thank you for joining us today. We're here to talk about critical design considerations for rapid diagnostic tests in a COVID-19 pandemic. So we, we're joined by a group of panel guests. So in no particular order, we've got Brendan O'Farrell, the president and co-founder of DCN Diagnostics. We got Davin Rolls, who's the president and CEO of Sona Nanotech. Klaus Hochleiner, who's our technical specialist at Cytiva, and David Wilson, who's the commercial director at Avacta. The format of today's call is we're going to have a discussion around three points, so understanding the different technologies available. Moving on to why a dual approach between those different technologies is the best approach, and then spend some time around the different design challenges that people will face when developing lateral flow tests, and what support exists to help developers. So to start, Brendan, would you like to help explain the different technologies available? Sure thing. Thanks, Lee. Um, so I guess the you know the met methods for for testing uh, relatives to SARS-CoV-2 infection really break down broadly, I suppose, into two, into molecular versus immunoassay. So molecular tests, we're looking for obviously the molecular material of the virus. You know, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, that's RNA. So the primary method used is RT-PCR, uh, and that starts by converting the viral RNA into DNA and then amplifying it using PCR to a level at which it can be detected. So several other isothermal amplification methods obviously are being uh, developed and implemented as well. So the main advantage of, of RT-PCR in this context is the, is the relative speed of the assay and the fact that it can be automated and high throughput. Uh, and it can be very sensitive and specific if it's developed correctly. So, uh, But obviously RT-PCR has its limitations as well. Uh, the primary sample used for detecting SARS-CoV-2 is a nasopharyngeal swab. Uh, and those are difficult to collect effectively, and they're really uncomfortable for the patient. Uh, taking them uh, also potentially exposes the healthcare worker, taking the sample to infection, uh, which has pushed us in the direction of a lot of thoughts around self-sampling. Uh, other sample types, like nasal swabs and tongue swabs, are being evaluated and implemented, uh, but they obviously come with their own challenges as well, uh, particularly when it comes to the performance of the assay. So traditional RT-PCR requires a lot of lab infrastructure, uh, a lot of equipment, trained users, um, and these tests are most commonly done at scale in, in central or hospital labs as a result. So more recently, we've seen some small instruments developed that can be deployed to more decentralized testing environments. Uh, and these have the advantage of a lot more portability, uh, but obviously they're complex instruments, uh, for the most part still requiring trained operators and at least some infrastructure and maintenance. So uh, there's also the primary issue, I suppose, of access, time to delivery of results and, and scale. Uh, and turnaround time right now uh, on centralized RT-PCR assays from sample to results is on the order of, of multiple days, uh, even in the best of circumstances. So processing of, of COVID-19 samples also requires biocontainment labs operated by highly trained technicians, obviously, uh, and for more resource limited countries with less access uh, to central laboratory resources and, and less capacity uh, than the developed nations, this kind of central lab testing at the required scale really isn't an option. Um, so the alternative approach uh, is immunoassay. And, and with this format, we're detecting the presence of specific proteins in a sample uh, that are indicative of current or previous infection. And these assays can either be instrument-based and run in a central lab, or they can be run at the point of care as a rapid assay. Uh, the most ubiquitous format of rapid assay being the lateral flow format, of course, that, that uh, most people are familiar with in the context of pregnancy testing or um, HIV testing or strep throat testing at the, at the doctor's office, but has been uh, applied as a very mature technology in literally hundreds of applications over the course of the last 30 years or so. So there are two primary applications of, of the immunoassay in the context of the pandemic, I suppose. There's antigen detection and antibody detection. There's a lot of different use cases around each type, uh, but in broad strokes, you know, the antigen detection uh, indicates the presence of viral proteins in the sample. Once again, typically the nasopharyngeal swab uh, in the current uh, embodiment. Uh, and the presence of these protein antigens, like the spike protein, is indicative of infection with the virus. So the value of the antigen testing uh, is probably self-evident. You know, if a swab taken from a patient tests positive, they're infected and, and likely infectious. 
uh, on the, the serological assay or the antibody detection assays. These use binding reagents to detect the presence of antibodies directed against the specific viral antigens. Uh, so typically we're looking at uh, IgG and IgM, uh, although there's growing evidence that IgA has, has utility in the context of COVID. So serological assays are useful uh, because a patient that's recovered from COVID-19, um, and once the virus is cleared from the body, the viral RNA is no longer available for detection in the respiratory tract. So there's really a pretty short window during the acute stage of infection in which SARS-CoV-2 can be detected using PCR or immunoassay for viral antigen detection. So while the PCR or antigen detection by immunoassay works well for a diagnosis of ongoing infection, it doesn't give a clear indication of whether a patient has been infected historically and potentially, and I, and I would put a lot of emphasis on the word potentially, uh, what their immune status might be. I'm sure we'll come back to that. Uh, but antibody tests have their limitations too. Um, the data is still emer emerging. Uh, it appears that the, the antibody response to COVID-19 is slow compared to a lot of other infections. Um, and with limited data, it appears that the, the initial IgM antibody response doesn't peak until about nine days after infection and the IgG response uh, is several days after that. And to put this into perspective, most viruses would elicit a primary immune response within about five days of infection. Now, because of this, SARS-CoV-2 antibodies uh, are unlikely to make good uh, markers of acute COVID-19 infection. So, you know, as a result, the detection of antibody alone for acute phase diagnosis isn't really viable. And, and the topic of whether a total antibody test is the ideal specification rather than one that differentiates IgG and IgM is being uh, pretty hotly debated in, in places. But while antibodies, you know, might not be appropriate for acute phase diagnosis, they still show a lot of valuable applications uh, in the context of COVID-19. So potentially the most valuable use of wide scale antibody testing is as a public health tool, uh, you know, indicating levels of exposure to the virus. There's lots of talk about using these assays to indicate immune status, but the science uh, is still largely out on whether that's a valuable use case for a lot of these tests. Uh, but to date, I'm aware of at least 12 different identified use cases for serology assays, uh, a lot of which required somewhat different assay specifications. So how to use these assays and, and develop them is going to be a hot topic uh, for some time to come. So hopefully that outlines the, the basic framework. Uh, lots of details and nuance in there to be debated and discussed. But uh, I'll hand back at that. Yeah, no, thanks, Brendan. That's brilliant. So I guess, you know, from that explanation, Klaus, are you able to help explain how, I guess, we're using both of the molecular and uh, amino assay approach in the real world to tackle this? Well, the point was the... Um molecular diagnostic test was that um, these were the first tests that had been developed because people quickly um, sequenced the virus, uh, created primers, and uh, were able to detect the um, virus in patient samples. Uh, as Brandon already pointed out, it's something that needs to be done in a centralized lab. Uh, it's something where you need an infrastructure, train people, you have to ship the samples to the lab, and it takes ages before you get the result back to the patient. And that means in that time, you, you either have to quarantine the patient uh, or the patient will spread the virus uh, to other people. Um, the uh, development of tests for antigens, for viral antigens is ongoing. Uh, so first test on the market was limited sensitivity, but the original idea is to have a test that identifies the patient um, as positive, let's say, in a, in a doctor's office um, and is then confirmed by a molecular diagnostic test in a central laboratory. So that would be a two-step approach. Um, and that should avoid um, at least false positives. The risk is false negatives. And the tests that are currently on the market, the best one has a sensitivity of 80%. Uh, that means of uh, 10 people that are really real positives that you test, you will miss two. Um, and that means in a moment as a standalone test, uh, it's not yet feasible. And this is what people are working on. Uh, what makes your life an additional misery is that, um, that there are four endemic human coronaviruses that cause 10 to 15% uh, of human common colds. Uh, these viruses are all closely related, so you have a fair chance of um, getting positive signals that are from a biologist, biologist's point of view, real positive signals. Um, and unfortunately, you detect the wrong virus. 
Um, things will get worse when we talk about antibody tests. Um, the first problem is that um, in a typical study, what you see is that the first IgMs appear on day five after onset of symptoms. And then you have 40 to 50% of the patients uh, developing the antibodies. Um, you will have IgMs in all patients around day nine or 10, uh, which makes that, as Brandon already said, a no-go for finding acute phase diagnostics. And uh, what is, is even more interesting is that um, antibodies against different coronaviruses cross-react. Uh, this has been uh, published for SARS-CoV-1 um, and uh, antibodies against the endemic human coronaviruses. We know it for the MERS uh, coronaviruses. It's the same story and it goes in, goes in both directions. And there is absolutely no reason to believe uh, that this will be by any means different for SARS-CoV-2. Um, and that means if you go for antibody tests, you have a, a very high uh, chance to get uh, an awful lot of false positives. That means uh, you will run into trouble with your epidemiological statistics. At the end, it means we need to develop um, more accurate uh, tests for the antigen in order to uh, help diagnose uh, COVID-19 in under-resourced regions uh, and even in, in what we call first world countries in, um, in a near patient situation in a doctor's office um, and then confirm that by a PCR test. What I do not buy in, to be honest, is the idea to have self-sampling. Um, self-sampling, regardless whether you use uh, nasopharyngeal uh, samples or saliva samples, has a very good chance uh, to fail due to uh, user errors um, and that makes that very difficult um, as a as a screening test uh, and this is what we are looking for and um, that means I would always opt for a test that uh, where the sampling is being done by a trained person which leads us back to the doctor's office so that's for the approach that is uh, uh, that is currently being used. So do an immunological uh, antigen test first, um, and then do a confirmatory test uh, for the positive tested people. Um, we have to develop antigen tests that have a sensitivity that's much better than 95%, uh, else it will not be useful for a screening test. And the antibody test that we are talking about will not involve a two-step approach. Uh, but they have a, a fair chance to give you false positives due to cross reactivities with the endemic human coronavirus antibodies. Um, and um, again, this needs to have a very high sensitivity and specificity in order to be useful as a screening tool to talk about um, immunity and the population, whatever that means. And uh, nobody knows how long it will last um, the problem is we know from all other coronaviruses, it doesn't last forever. And again, there is no reason to believe that this will be the case, uh, that this will not be the case for this new coronavirus. Okay, the end, thank you. Um, yeah, we will need to test for a very long period of time. Yeah. Okay, no, thank you, Klaus. I think that uh, you said quite a good picture of how complicated this is to get something with the required level of uh, sensitivity and accuracy that we need, which I know you touched on a few different areas there, you know, such as sample collection and uh, other pieces, but maybe David, you can help um, start the conversation around some of the design considerations and some of the challenges that um, you know, typically you've encountered during uh, development. Um Yes, so out of ACTA, we, we've been focused on the development of a uh, antigen test um, uh, on a lateral flow platform and recently announced our collaboration with Cytiva uh, to develop that particular test. Um, the aim is, is to develop a test that can be easily deployed in a community, primary care, and a, uh, you know, a, a consumer uh, setting. We believe the uh, lateral flow format is is the really the only format that we're aware of that will enable the mass testing or mass population screening that's going to be required in order to get society back to normal, whatever normal will be. Um, and there is a lot of demand for this type of testing 
um, outside the traditional healthcare settings. Um, one of the biggest opportunities is uh, to enable workforce testing, for example, uh, to get workers back into into companies, um, uh, to get you know s sporting events back, uh, concerts, uh, public transport. Um, so there's a there's there's a huge demand. So we've been focused on the development of a test which will enable that to happen. Um, so that that's good. that requires a what we think is a lateral flow uh, format and uh, saliva um, as a sample as opposed to the nasopharyngeal swabs. So um, some of the, the the challenges. Well, one of them is time. Um, you know, typically these tests take. You know, many months. Uh, you know, 18 months, 18 to 24 months to develop. Uh, we don't have the luxury of that um, at the moment. Uh, so, uh, all companies I know that are developing these and other COVID-19 tests are trying to do it in a way that's different from how it's normally done in order to accelerate the time to market. And and clearly that introduces, um, you know, a, a, a somewhat risk. Um, uh, but uh, you know we can't. We don't have the luxury of uh, 18 to 24 months um, to to get these these products out. So that's um, that's one uh, very big challenge. Um, also, the uh, access to uh, clinical samples. Um, you know they are in high demand and short supply. Um, increasingly so as the uh, as the pandemic uh, starts to. Um, uh, disappear. Although I agree with Klaus's earlier comments that the need for testing and the demand for testing is not going to go away for a very long time. You know, we anticipate that the, there will be a need for testing, you know, in, in very significant numbers uh, for at least another 12 months. So time is a challenge. Um, and um, the develop a, a test that can be deployed in these settings is also uh, one of the biggest challenges for a diagnostic test developer um, because of the the need to develop a, a test that can be used uh, easily by um, a consumer, for example, uh, for a self-test. Uh, so that's a challenge. Uh, it's also a challenge from the regulatory approval process. Um, you know, typically the regulatory approval for these tests um, and the clinical validation study needs. Are, are, are significant. So again, the uh, authorities, uh, the FDA, for example, um, the MHRA in the UK um, are looking at ways to uh, provide accelerated approval processes for these tests so we can enable them to get to market. Otherwise, again, they won't be coming to market in time to uh, enable us to fight this, uh, this pandemic. So there are a lot of challenges associated with the fact that we're trying to get something to market um, much, much more quickly than, than than we would traditionally do as a as a diagnostic product manufacturing company, and and to be honest, are are you know probably more comfortable um, doing with the the more standard timelines. Um, but um, you know we th these these tools are absolutely required. Without them, uh, it's going to be much more difficult for us to um, to get society back back to normal. So there's a uh, and then on top of the, all of this, there's supply chain issues. I mean, I, I'm outlining lots of problems, um, but they're they're really just to introduce maybe topics of conversation for the rest of the the, the webinar. Um, because of the the demand for for these for these tests, the supply is under a lot of strain, and that's the supply not just of the tests themselves, but all the components uh, and raw materials. And that's an issue which needs to be addressed because the the supply chain needs to be ramped up um, again. In a, in a in a time scale which it's never been done before so yeah it's it's uh it's just an outline of some of the the major the major hurdles and and, uh, and challenges that we're we're facing at the moment to get these products to market okay thanks david Darren, is there anything you'd like to elaborate upon what uh, david's added or anything you didn't introduce from your side well uh, yeah thanks lee um well, as, as David outlined, you know, I think uh, you can. You, everybody listening to this can probably get a sense of the enormous challenge that uh, anybody that's developing one of these tests is up against, uh, for sure. Um, and and it, is, it does come down to time constraints. 
Um, you know, that, that's a major thing. Um, you know, David outlined you know, all, all the problems that we're seeing. Um, you know, so I'm not going to kind of dwell on those. We, you know, they, they, they'll be discussed as, as we go through this presentation. I think one of the one of the major things that um, you know Sona has come up against with regards to challenging, um, in terms of our biggest hurdle, it is probably that um, you know access to some of those materials. Um, you know, be it everything from uh, test component materials all the way through, you know, to, to some of the specific biological materials that you need to get uh, to be utilised. Um, you know, and similar to the you know, test, um, Sona's test has been based around, you know, it's an antigen-based test. Um, you know, we are initially we're focusing on the nasal pharyngeal swab uh, type systems. Um, but uh, our, our platform and our process is easily adaptable to other matrices, including uh, you know, saliva as well. Uh, but uh, our first pass and our first priority really is to um, you know, kind of see a critical path to developing a test uh, you know, utilizing um, a nasal pharyngeal swab. Um, you know, so, so alongside all the other kind of constraints that David uh, you know, kind of outlined around you know, time, regulatory clinical pathway um access to materials etc uh, you know it, i think we echo one another and um, you know and, we, and we've spoken um you know offline around these things many times um one of the other major things uh, probably that there is going to be a challenge is we're certainly a topic of discussion that david just touched on is the infrastructure around um, you know the development of rapid tests now typically you know lateral flow tests hundreds and hundreds of millions of these tests um, you know, produced every year across a plethora of different disease states and for many other use case scenarios. But they typically, there's probably maybe a handful or two of core material suppliers for things like membranes um, and pads and, and antibodies even, um, but then also machinery to produce these tests. You know, there's, unless, you're, unless you have a, a significant production setup in-house, uh, which obviously some of the major players uh, do, uh, but everybody else doesn't, and they utilise um, you know CMOs that are out there, contract manufacturing organisations, and again, there's typically a handful of those. Um, that uh, you know, obviously we're in discussions with multiple uh, groups around that, and um, you know, one of those challenges is about around uh, beyond the test development process itself. Uh, you then typically would go through a tech transfer process. Uh, which again, normally uh, we talk about normal versus expedited timeframes. That that process is normally a six-month process in itself, um, and we're asking those CMOs to pretty much rip up the rule book, um, you know, uh, but but still make sure that they're adhering to those quality systems to make sure products that are transferred are done so correctly and then produced at the scale of manufacture that is expected because, um, you know. As we know, the, the mass screening that's required here, uh, that's uh, expected, uh, you know, to ramp up production from even even from a few million tests to hundreds of millions of tests, which is what we all anticipate is needed. Um, you know, is a huge task on uh, you know not just us as test developers, uh, but also on the manufacturing organisations as well. And those typical those manufacturing organisations are typically serviced by again a handful of companies that. You know, produce the manufactured equipment. Um, so it, it's a, you know, as a, as a diagnostics industry as a whole, everybody that's in this tight network have all um, recognised the challenges. We've all kind of, um, everybody's come together uh, very, very quickly. You know, what we're once seen as competitors are now certainly collaborators. Um, everybody's working hard together to kind of, uh, you know, allow each other to bring those tests to market because everybody can see the need, uh, you know, for that. So supposedly, just to, to pick up a little on the on the topic of, of development challenges, you know, the uh, DCN Diagnostics is a is a contract developer of lateral flow assays. This is what we this is what we do for a living. It's what we've done for 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 several decades now. And um, you know, so we're we're used to dealing with the with the with the typical challenges, right? That that, it, that everybody in the industry is aware of. You know, starting from the concepts of designing really usable tests for point of care application, which covers everything from getting the right sample to getting the test to run correctly to making sure it can be interpreted correctly digitally or by eye. Um, 
to the analytical challenges of just making the system work, selecting the right reagents, getting the right materials, ensure that everything, as 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 uh, as, as Darren and David said, what goes through the correct process and goes through it correctly ultimately ending up in a, in a properly validated product that can then be scaled and manufactured, right? Um, so all of those challenges still exist here, but as you say, we're, you know, obviously we're trying to com compress this timeline. And, and we're doing it based on a, on, on a real risk benefit analysis, right? So there's, there, there is risk to this kind of acceleration. And, and the reason we go through that usual process of development is to end up with a really robust reproducible product that can be scaled, right? Uh, and as Darren points out, that, that scaling and that manufacturing requires a very, very specific and quite limited skill set. Um, so one thing that in this whole process that can't be clawed back, you know, obviously de development happens on a continuum, so we can draw the lines anywhere in the process to say we've reached a point where we're happy to release this product to market. We've reached a point where we're happy to submit this to a regulatory authority under an emergency youth author authorization or whatever the case may be. But what we can't claw back in that process is time, right? So we are drawing a line in that development process at a point where we haven't, by definition, under any circumstances, demonstrated that our products are highly reproducible and highly scalable at the level at which we're going to have to manufacture them. So there's inherent risk in that process. Um, so what we have to do as development organizations and manufacturing organizations is try to pull back as much of that risk as we can through, you know, the, still the proper application of development methodologies and understanding that even after we have released these products to market in this specific instance, uh, development continues. Right. This is this is not a there's not a defined line here that says this product is done. Um, it's the exact opposite. In fact, you know, from every level of this process, the fact that the target product profiles are still shifting, both for antigen and for antibodies. So we actually don't really have a great idea of what the final product has to be. We're making some very well, well educated guesses. Um, but that's that's going to change. So the target product profile is going to change. The performance requirements are going to change. Our understanding of the process is going to change. Our experience with these processes is going to change over time. So this is going to be very much an evolutionary process. Um, and and one of the things when we're talking about supply chain that 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 we see as I, I guess one of the bigger risks. Certainly, we all understand the reagent supply issues. We understand the material supply issues. We understand the you know the manufacturing equipment side of things. One of the biggest gaps we see in the market and is is knowledge and it's and it's education. You know, a lot a lot of companies have been forced into a position where they're having to scale manufacturing processes really quickly. Uh, they're having to do so with with people who may not have the experience level that that we'd like to see. You know, in these processes. And again, there's a there's a risk benefit being done here. We need these products. But I, but I certainly wouldn't sk skip over the the question of the knowledge gap that's in this market right now. We need we need more trained people. We need more experienced people, and that's unfortunately not something that's going to happen quickly. But it's something that we need to work on too. No, I think it's very good. And one of the things, sorry, one of the things I was going to add. I know that. Um, you touched on it very briefly earlier. Was about uh, the importance of time to market. Sorry, the time to test, and um, getting a quick result on these. Which, you know, it's critical that um, we have a instant result where the current bottleneck is taking several days sometimes for results. Do you want to help expand on that piece that you mentioned earlier, Brendan? Sorry, Lee, you actually broke up on me there just a little bit. So the question was on, on time to result. Yeah, when we're talking about the different technologies and you introduced that, um, you're saying that lateral flow, you know, the importance of this is, you know, getting a quick result. And I guess, you know, there's some of the challenges around that, I guess, in what you're saying sure. about the less reproducibility and that you're able to go for at the moment. Well, you know, the, the time to result, obviously, in, in the context of the testing that we're doing, time to result is critical, right? So um, one of the benefits of lateral flow technology you know, as a platform is that allows us to take a sample, do the test on the spot and have a result within minutes. Um, now, we can couple that obviously with, with reading technologies as well, whether they're, you know, within the cassette, whether they're external readers um, and do instantaneous data gathering, databasing, we can have all of that data available 
uh, in real time as well. So there's, there's obvious benefits to that in the context, particularly of antigen testing, where we're trying to get to a, a decision as to whether somebody has an active infection really quickly, um, get them into quarantine, take whatever uh, measures need to be taken to ensure their health and safety and that of the people around them. Um, and so, so having that instantaneous or virtually instantaneous result is a really, really huge benefit. Um, now, in the context of you know mass population screening, uh, you know particularly in, in the U.S., you know the, U the U.S. has growing uh, capacity for centralized laboratory testing, where we can take those samples. Turnaround times will improve, but we're still talking about probably days from sample collection to delivery of that result. So in the context of antigen testing, that still introduces a gap where there's, where there's significant risk. Um, now in the context of antibody testing, where we have so many potential use cases that people are looking at, and some of them do require that instantaneous results, right? So you know, some of the back to work testing or you know, testing of healthcare providers or uh, whatever the case may be, we need that results, right? And, and, and this, uh, the, the, both from a serology and an antigen perspective, I think the lateral flow platform provides probably the only available solution. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really ideally suited to this uh, in, in, in many, many ways. Okay, thank yeah, you, Bernard. To the technology, that, that, that's correct. The pro my problem is that uh, we need specificities and sensitivities on, on an extremely large scale that is definitely unprecedented. Uh, simply due to the fact that's a mass screening test and this has never been done before. Uh, in all electric flow tests that we have on the market, you have patients that show symptoms um, and you know, that you want to test. Uh, what we want to do now is we would like to test people that have no symptoms. We have not the slightest idea whether they have, an, they have or had an infection and we need a test that gives us an actual result um, on the answers to these questions. And uh, that's a completely different beast. And uh, right. the second problem is this, this virus is a new virus, and that means it's a rapidly moving target. Uh, currently, I'm, I'm seeing about 50 papers at least per week published on, on preprint service, so you can't read them all. Um, and but by the knowledge that that is gathered and the surprises that uh, that are appearing as, as really astounding. And uh, we as, as, as test developers or material developers or reagent developers have to try to take pace with it. And that, that's a real challenge. Uh, and from an algorithmic perspective, you know, one, one of the biggest differences here is that we're talking about utilizing a serology test in a way that it's not normally used, right? So serology tests are usually reflexed to some kind of an orthogonal message for confirm or method for confirmation, right? Depending on you know, the, the, the endemicity of the environment they're used in. So uh, in this case, we may not have that safety net. So it's different. Yeah, it's different. There, there's absolutely no safety net. Yeah, I think the, the sensitivity issue, Klaus, that you brought up, and we've had numerous conversations about this over the past few weeks. Um, as you say, I think it's uh, it's a major challenge, uh, you know, for, for anybody developing a test, trying to get that sensitivity level down. Um, you know, I think we discussed whether you need to get viral load readings down to you know the ten to the two, ten to the three level, um, you know, just to get a sense of a limit of detection of, of these tests, and if not lower, um, you know, to detect you know viral loads in patients, um, because. Say that differentiation between symptomatic or pre-symptomatic patients and, and asymptomatic patients um, is a mass difference. You know, when it comes to screening, because I think um, you know, pre even pre-symptomatic patients, um, you know, it, it's hard for them to get a test in many countries. Um, you know, that certainly don't have huge capacity for centralized lab testing. Um, you know, so I think screening tests like uh, you know the ones that we're trying that we're all trying to develop here, um, whether it be antigen or antibody based. Um, you know, certainly have their role to play in it. And uh, as we've alluded to before, that risk benefit, you know, kind of trade off is the main key thing. But again, coming back to the, the some of those technical challenges, the sensitivity is going to be the one, the major issue. Um, and there is that specificity issue around that cross reactivity interference, um, you know, whether the existing kind of SARS based. Uh, viruses that are floating around in the environment. So um, again, beyond you know, supply chain and organizational issues, there's actual technical issues that simply need to be overcome uh, you know, by everybody as well. 
um, and they pose their own challenges. But uh, I think uh, you know the world and certainly our space is full of smart scientists, and we're all working hard to overcome those issues. Um, and I think we're you know. Uh, I'm, I'm sure together we'll all be able to uh, you know, do so. Uh, yeah, that's right. I, th I think specificity is something that, that many people overlook at that point. Uh, let's assume you have 5% uh, uh, of, of uh, the population with, with an active infection. Um, th that may or may not show symptoms, so that, that's the big problem. Um, and uh, you have a specificity of 95%, which means that uh, of 100 negative patients, 5% will come up with a false positive. The outcome of that is, even if you have 100% sensitivity, that um, it's, it's, it's been a little bit more complicated mathematically, but uh, what you would have is that from all of these positive tested people, 50% uh, are false positives. Um, and uh, that, that's, that's a problem because everybody uh, would say, oh, come on, what, what is this for a test? Because uh, when you run the confirmatories on a PCR test, for example, 50% uh, of these patients um, turn out to be negative, but you have quarantined them. You have uh, probably uh, looked for contact persons. You have put a quarantine on the contact persons. Um, and, and uh, you panicked an awful lot of people, and at the end, people will say that the test, uh, the rapid test, is nuts, um, and that's also something that needs to be considered. Yeah, and just building on that, uh, Klaus. Obviously, when you're looking at trying to get, you know, the best test will be high sensitivity, high specificity, but often it's a trade-off, isn't it? When you're trying to um, get, you know, to get high sensitivity, often you, you know you have to give something on specificity and vice versa. I think for the antigen test, um, the uh, the bias will be, you know, obviously sensitivity and negative predictive value. Um, you know, it's not ideal having too many false positives, but I think it's even worse um, having too many false negatives. Um, at least with the false positives, there may be a, a, a way to introduce a confirmatory test for those, but the false negatives, you would never know. Um, and. Uh, to have someone walking around thinking that they're they're not infected when they are um, uh, could be a, would be a, a much much more uh, difficult problem. So I think if if you if you have to go one way or the other, then, then for the antigen test, the bias should probably be towards uh, sensitivity. Yeah, Ideally, yes. high at both levels, yeah. but. Uh, that definitely yes. So in an, in an infectious disease test, regardless of what we are talking about, it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, or COVID-19. No. Um, in an infectious disease test, what you're looking for is, is the best possible sensitivity because you do not want to see any false negatives. Uh, you will never That's get 100% right. sensitivity since there will always be clinical outliers that you simply will never find regardless how good you do your, your, your clinical validation. Um, but the difference we have here is in, in uh, just opposite to any other uh, infectious disease test that, that is uh, on the market is we want to do a screening test and that makes specificity uh, a bigger hurdle than, than usual. Uh, let's assume you look for a, uh, you do a hepatitis B test and you have reasons to do the hepatitis B test. And if you have some, if you have 95% uh, specificity, um, the few false positives that you have will, um, the number will be much lower than the, the real positives that you have. In the screening test, a 95% R specificity can easily bring you to more false positives than, than right positives. And, and that, mm. that makes, that, that will give you problems. Um, yeah. Not necessarily on the market, but you will run a, a large number of confirmatory tests that come back negative. And uh, as I said, you will, you will create uh, a lot of trouble with the patients, uh, with, the, with their environment, their personal environment, their, their work environment. So you may shut down complete factories due to false, uh, false positive tests, and that's the worst case. And that's something we need to deal with. Yeah. Okay. I, you know, we've got about five minutes left, and I think that I need to jump in because you could probably spend another half hour or so, you know, probably longer, it's still going around with uh, the team on the call. So maybe we can. I'll cover some more in the questions that come up from uh, the audience, but maybe as a way of you know closing the call and summarising, if we can go around each person maybe in alphabetical order, 
So, Sam, Brendan, this may be any advice you could give to people looking to develop these tests or what support is available that you could help advise them through to? Well, I mean, there there is a there's an enormous amount of support available, you know, so um, particularly, you know, the, the U.S. system is the one we know best. You know, there's, there's a lot of support in the U.S. system right now. Uh, coming from NIH, coming from BARDA, coming from a variety of different areas, both from a funding and from a networking and from a technical perspective. Um, you know, within the industry itself, um, you know, there's, again, there's a, there's a network of core providers that have historically existed within the lateral flow space. Uh, companies like ourselves that, that, that are on this this call. Uh, and I think we, we have historically all had a... a a culture of, of both promoting the best possible practices within the ladder flow industry uh, and assisting companies coming into the industry. So there, there is quite a bit of technical resource available from the materials providers, from the reagent providers, from companies like ourselves that are contract developers and educators and trainers and contract manufacturers. Um, so there is quite a bit of support already out there inherent in the industry. You know, everybody is everybody is strapped from a bandwidth perspective. You know, everybody is busy right now. Uh, but at the same time, we all recognize the the importance of this. Um, and I think, as an industry, one of the one of the most heartening parts of this, for from my my own perspective, has has been watching the reaction to this from the from the service and materials and, and equipment side of the business, from the people who really facilitate the, the development and manufacture of these, um, the industry has really come together in, in, in quite an incredible way. So I think anybody, anybody who touches really any one of the core suppliers in the industry is going to get networked very quickly into the other aspects of what they need. So, um, you know, we're here, we're here to support both the, the, the companies that are that are newer to the industry, as well as, you know, the, the more mature developers and manufacturers or that, that are, you know, just under pressure with this whole thing to, to have to develop products while validating them, while standing up new manufacturing lines and new facilities, while training new people. Um, you know, we're all here to, to, to help as best we can. Okay, thank you. And Darren? Uh, yeah, um, just to, I guess, in uh, Brendan's comments, really, around how that network has all come together. It's uh, really encouraging. It's really heartwarming. Um, you know, I've been part of it for, you know, nigh on 15 years in various guises uh, through contract manufacturing organizations to now kind of heading up a, a test development group ourselves. Um, you know, and I found that that network that I, Kind of got in touch with over the years and, and built, um, you know, uh, certainly kind of come to fruition in helping us deliver um, you know this test to market as, as quickly as we've been able to. Um, you know, my advice to anybody kind of stepping into this is um, a initially look at what's already in the market. Um, you know, to determine whether you know is there is there an opportunity here for me to compete in that market with that test, um, albeit that. You know, we're going to be testing for COVID, you know, yeah, SARS-CoV-2 for a long, long time. Um, you know, you want to make sure that you're in a position, uh, you know, to, to make sure your business is competing there. Um, so once you've identified which area you want to kind of work into, get in contact with as many people as you can within this network, be it um, somebody like Brendan at DCN to help with that test development, be it uh, with people like Klaus, um, you know, and yourself, Lee, uh, you know, around those membrane suppliers, and we'll then certainly put you in touch with all the other key suppliers for materials. You know, uh, reach out to people like myself and David who supply some of, some of the reagents into, those, uh, into the network as well. Um, you know, because you're going to need that. You're going to need that support. Um, you know, as well as the, the end manufacturers um, and even regulatory and quality support as well. And one of the first things we did when we started doing this uh, was reach out to the FDA uh, and get that contact in there, understand what they needed uh, as part of this and what they were going to do. And, and they held their hands up and they were like, we don't really know yet. Tell you what, let's work together and try and figure this out, um, you know, which was great in, in one way. And it helped us um, you know, kind of steer our path down that critical path. So it certainly... Use the network that's there. Um, it's a it's a fantastic and heartwarming network that's accessible to everybody, and they'll they'll, they'll embrace everybody with open arms. Oh, thank you, Darren. That's uh, really insightful. David, anything to add from your side? Well, I mean, I think uh, Darren and Brendan have pretty much covered it, but 
Um, I would just like to add that uh, that sort of network and, and collaborative effort um, extends to the you know to the different uh, players, different companies in the industry itself. I you know I've been in the industry for many years as as we all have, and I've I, I've never experienced such a collaborative effort. Um, and putting aside some of, some of the normal competitive uh, issues, um, there's a collective effort to get these products to market um, um, as as quickly as we can. So that's that's heartening. I also think the uh, uh, what, by going through this now, uh, the industry is going to be more pandemic ready next time because there will be a next time, and there may be a next time for this current pandemic, um, but there will be another pandemic. And I think what we've gone through in terms of getting ourselves prepared to uh, develop products which will help tackle this pandemic will put us in a very good place um, for the, the next time it happens. We'll be able to respond much more quickly. And I think for the industry as a whole, um, th this has been uh, it's an opportunity for the industry to showcase what we can do and what value our products actually have, um, because that, I think, has been somewhat under the radar uh, for, for, for many, many years. And um, so those are, I think those are those are many of the, of the positives. So someone coming into this, I think would um, uh, would find a, 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 an awful lot of support from all the different uh, sectors that um, Brendan and uh, and Darren have have said, including companies that they would typically uh, see as their competitors. Okay, excellent. Thank you, David. Klaus, anything briefly from your side because we're about to reach the Q and A. So some some famous last words. Yeah, I, I I could bore you with with another comment on networking, and I will definitely do that. So so what, what all of us have, have have told you is yes, networking is key here. Uh, we talk about an unprecedented situation about a a pandemic uh, that will um, and, and nobody will able to deal with that alone. So the advice is get out of your ivory tower. Don't try to reinvent the wheel on your own. And, and talk to people, talk to, to reagent suppliers, to material suppliers, and uh, work in, in a network. And that's the only chance we have uh, to get uh, this pandemic under control, to have, to have tests developed uh, that really do the job that we want them to do, um, and to be prepared for, yeah, um, another pandemic um, or the reappearance of uh, SARS-CoV-2 because uh, if there's one thing that is sure, it's not over yet, and uh, this virus will stay with us. So uh, there, there's enough work to do. Okay, excellent. And um, I guess that brings us up to our Q and A deadline. So thank you, everybody else. I think it's been you know excellent. Really appreciate your insights and your input. And I'm sure the audience and everyone joining this session will you know echo that comment as well. So. Thank you very much, and we'll end you and hand over to our Q&A.